So good evening, everyone, and a very hearty welcome to you all. This session is on Westlessness in the World, Multilateralism in a Changing World Order. And it is a great honor and a pleasure for me to serve as moderator for this discussion. We have an exciting and lively one and a half hours ahead of us with extremely distinguished panelists. And to kickstart the panel discussion, we have with us the Federal Foreign Minister of Germany, Heiko Maas, who will be addressing us for 10 minutes. Under Heiko Maas's leadership, Germany has been playing a key role in reinvigorating the political, policy, and public debate on multilateralism. So without further ado, let me invite Minister Maas to take the floor and to share with us his ideas on the state of play and beyond. Please join me in welcoming the Federal Foreign Minister of Germany, Heiko Maas. Ja, sehr geehrter Herr Ischinger, Ambassador Ischinger, distinguished colleagues, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the world in disorder. This was one of the catchphrases six years ago when then Federal President Joachim Gauck was in Munich here and spoke at this conference and called for more German responsibility. If you listen to his successor this afternoon, we must admit that the world in disorder, that is a catchphrase of yesterday, not because the rule-based world order continued its success story started 75 years ago, but because international cooperation has been going through an unprecedented recession for years. A new order is being developed, but it has little to do with principles such as liberal or rule-based. What is new? It's not the rise of China, which we've seen for decades, and the shrinking strategic significance of Europe after the end of the Cold War. That isn't new either. The real game changer is the fact that an era of omnipresent American policemen, global policemen, is over and everyone can see that. Think of Syria, think of Afghanistan and Africa. Not because the United States are lacking military or economic power, but because the commitment of those responsible in the White House has changed when it comes to the world order that the United States have helped bring about. This is a geopolitical gap that is especially apparent in the Middle and Near East, and this gap is filled by others, Russia, Turkey, Iran, and they often stand for different values, different interests, and different concepts of world order. So the future of the Middle East is decided upon in Astana or Sochi rather than Geneva or New York. Such systems are often built on sand. We can see that when we think of the escalation in Idlib. So, ladies and gentlemen, we Americans and Europeans, we must ask ourselves the question how we could allow it to happen and what we can do in order to change this. We must be critical of ourselves. We Europeans have long closed our eyes to uncomfortable realities. What does it mean for the United States to withdraw from military commitments and from international contracts? We've closed our eyes, but even if we'd kept our eyes open, we couldn't have foreseen how quickly the pendulum of American diplomacy and politics would swing the other way. But there's some good in this development. We saw this during the presentations and discussions we've heard. Everyone in Europe has now understood that we need to do more for our security and for the stability of our neighborhood. And it is true, Europe is doing more. 
from Ukraine to the close and Middle East to Libya and Sahel, the Sahel region. We do military things, civilian things, and diplomatic things, but it's not enough. All these crises will keep us busy here in Munich and during the discussions we we'll have here. So let me focus on three statements. First of all, Europe is going to play on its strength. It will have to do that. Of course, I'm thinking of the development of a European security and defense Europe as a strong pillar, European pillar of NATO. And this is the most important challenge when it comes to shaping the Europe of the future, the 2020s. It's not a matter of whether we're going to do this. The question is how. We cooperate closely with France. And we're going to take President Macron up on his offer of a strategic dialogue to deal with these questions. So we will have to do that, and we will. Let me put it clearly. Germany is prepared to increase its commitment, and that includes our military commitment. But this military commitment must be embedded in a political reasoning. And this is just what our federal president, Frank-Walter Steinmeier, said this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, our former defense minister, Peter Stroke, was right when he said, German security is also defended at the Hindukush. And from today's perspective, we must add the same is true for Iraq, for Libya, and for the Sahel region. But the same is true for negotiating tables in New York, Geneva, and Brussels. Without diplomacy, without clear political strategies, without capacities that can be built in the regions affected, military operations will, in the best case, be ineffective, but in the worst case, they can exacerbate crises. We saw that after 2003 in Iraq, and we are now witnessing the same development in Syria and Libya. More responsibility, more commitment cannot be the same as more military, because if you think that way, you can never solve the complexity of these conflicts. I'm thinking of Europe's economic power, without which the reconstruction of Syria will not be possible. And at the same time, we must achieve a political solution. We will not participate in a reconstruction process that will result in securing Assad's power. But uh, as important as that is the presence of models that Europe can provide that work in the long run. After the wars of the past, we've seen this development many times, the Westphalian peace, the Vienna World Order, the Treaties of Rome, and the Helsinki Final Act. Russia, Turkey, and others may be able to achieve short-term success in Syria, in Ukraine, or in Libya. But where are approaches that work in the long run, that achieve sustainable stability and peace? Because different players can identify with them. So Germany and France have been working on a peaceful solution for Ukraine for many years. In the last few months, we have revived the Minsk peace process, supported by the new Ukrainian president. We have worked for the separation of troops and the exchange of prisoners. That is only part of the solution. The main question is, are all the parties involved prepared to move beyond the reasoning of geopolitical influence and to work together on a European security is based on international law. So we will talk about this here in Munich with our colleagues from Paris, from Moscow and Kiev, and thus we will lay the basis for another Normandy format meeting in Berlin. Ladies and gentlemen, it is no coincidence that the efforts to achieve peace in Libya emanated from Rome, from Paris, and lately from Berlin. The Security Council reinforced the results of the long and difficult negotiations that took place in Berlin. 
Last week, the parties to the conflict negotiated a ceasefire for the very first time. And on Sunday, the foreign ministers will meet here in Munich in order to continue the process started in Berlin and to create a mechanism to monitor and implement the decisions that were taken there. On Monday, we will talk about this with the European foreign ministers. We'll talk about the contribution that the EU can make in order to implement the weapons embargo. For the EU, there can only be one answer, and I'm looking at Josep Borrell now. We are ready to help when the United States nations and the parties to the conflict ask for our support. Ladies and gentlemen, my second point is we must adapt our multilateral alliances to the new geopolitical realities. This is true for the European Union, first and foremost. Its geopolitical approach will not be limited to a new strategy towards China or to a more realistic view to new technologies. We're talking about more European sovereignty, from a political, from an economic, from a technological, technological and from a values-based point of view. So we will have to come to an agreement with a new EU Commission, and we in Germany will preside over the EU Council in the second part of this year, and this is a great opportunity. We must reconsider the role to be played by NATO as well. In 2003, NATO did not take part in the war in Iraq, and that was the right decision, but now, 17 years later, the situation is different. Now we're talking about training Iraqi security forces to fight terrorism, terrorists of the Islamic State, and the Iraqi government has asked for NATO support because NATO respects Iraqi sovereignty. It stands for a multilateral approach. We all share the interest to preserve what we have taken great efforts to achieve in the last few years. So we would like to continue our commitment in Iraq with the consent of the Iraqi government, be it as part of the anti-IS coalition or be it as part of a NATO mission. So at the end of the day, this will take care of two strategic interests. First of all, we continue our policies in the Middle East, which means de-escalation, not maximum pressure. And secondly, we can help keep the United States in this partnership. This can lead to a new transatlantic dynamics, and this is not a side effect, it is our objective. So my third point is more European contributions will keep the United States on board. I'm thinking of, of Afghanistan. In the past few months, we provided support to the United States. We supported them in negotiating a peace agreement between the parties to the conflict in Afghanistan. An internal Afghan dialogue has been initiated. So we think the reports about a possible understanding between the United States and the Taliban are very positive news. Whether it results in lasting peace depends on the continuation of these negotiations, and we must not go back on what we have achieved. In together, out together is the principle, so that should be our guiding principle. And we are the la second largest uh, troop contributor in Afghanistan. I'm also thinking of the Sahel region, which has become a safe haven for international terrorism. Germany and Europe are strongly committed there, militarily and by civilian measures. In the last three years, we invested three billion euros in the stability of the region. We are prepared to do more. We work on security policies and we help build state structures here. And we will need the United States to do this, because at the end of the day, Islamist terror is a threat to people in da Bamako, just the same as in Paris, Berlin, or Boston. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, we must talk about transatlantic burden sharing. It's true. In Brussels, in Washington, and here in Munich, and in Berlin. We know we must do more. The federal president line uh, 
I pointed it out this afternoon, and we've started doing that. But let us not narrow down the discussion to this single question. The strength of an alliance cannot be measured in terms of euros or dollars. What we need is a true political debate about the transatlantic partnership in the 21st century. Bearing in mind the uh, situation we live in today, the new realities. This is a process we initiated in December last year in the framework of NATO. We believe that not maximum disruption, but discussion is the way to achieve good results. That is the only way forward. We know that only by acting together can we summon the economic power, the military potential, and the political ideas we need in order to defend our rules-based global order. Let us start where the westlessness we read about in the Munich Security Report it can be felt. First of all, it is in the crisis before our front door. And uh, this includes Iraq, Syria, Libya, Ukraine, and the Sahel region. Let's make sure we do not repeat the, the mistakes of the past. Let us not leave these crises to those who export weapons and mercenaries, but not security and peace. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Minister Maas, for that very stimulating speech. You have given us a lot of food for thought. And so um, it is now my great pleasure uh, to invite our esteemed panelists to join me on stage. So um, our first panelist is uh, Dr. Subramaniam Jayashankar, the Minister of External Affairs for the Republic of India. Dr. Jayashankar, please. Um, our second panelist um, is Margarita Vestager, to, and I invite her to join us on stage. She is the Executive Vice President for a Europe Fit for, the digi di for a Digital Age of the European Commission. Thank You're you. very welcome. Thank you. Joining Ms. Vestager and Dr. Jayashankar is uh, Ms. Kyungba Kang, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Republic of Korea. Thank you. Thank you. And last, but certainly not least, I am very happy to welcome Senator Lindsey Graham on stage, the Chairman of the Senate Committee on the Judiciary, United States of America. privileged to have you here with us to address some of the very fundamental problems that we are facing today. And um, both on the questions of Westlessness and multilateralism. And I'm hoping we can also try and explore some solutions in the course of our discussion together. Uh, a warm welcome to the four of you. And the plan is to have an exchange amongst the panelists followed by a Q&A session with you, esteemed audience, and also questions coming in from a live stream uh, with the engaged public at large. So if you see me fiddling with this device, it's not because I'm checking my Twitter feed. It really is because I'm looking for questions that people are sending in. So now, to set the ball rolling, I would like to begin our debate with a simple but a but a fundamental question, which I pose to the four of you. And I would be grateful if you were to restrict your remarks to about three to four minutes each. And we have further time for debate that way. And the question is, is, is a simple but not a simplistic one. And it is, 
there seems to be a recognition across countries that global problems need collective solutions. We heard that in many of the presentations today as well. There is a recognized need for multilateralism because multilateralism is an instrument that can help us achieve these goals. And yet, we find multilateralism in facing se serious challenges. Why is that the case? Is it because of, is it because multilateralism has failed to serve its purpose for individual countries, for individual actors? Or is it that the world has changed so dramatically that our old institutions are no longer fit for purpose? Or is it this westlessness that we have been discussing um, today? Or is it something entirely different? Dr. Jashankar, why don't I start with you? Please. Thank you. Uh, first of all, let me say it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, so uh, let me uh, sort of uh, look at the two key concepts you mentioned, multilateralism and westlessness. Now, uh, I think uh, clearly multilateralism has become weaker, and clearly westlessness is in evidence. And I would suggest that there is a correlation between the two. It's not to say that multilateralism is solely dependent on the West, or the West has always been faithfully multilateral. I think it is not. But there is, there is a relationship. So what has led to weaker multilateralism and restlessness? I think the first point is we've seen in the last 20, 30 years economic rebalancing in the world. It was a question of time before economic rebalancing translated into political rebalancing. And we are seeing that. I mean, in 2008, uh, G7, G8 became G20. I think that's the beginning of an era. Uh, it's not the last word. So if there's going to be uh, a political rebalancing, then clearly uh, we, are, we are going to be in a, in a transition era. The second is that there is no question the world is more nationalistic. Uh, and uh, it's more nationalistic. The United States is more nationalistic. China is more nationalistic. Different countries in the world uh, are. A uh, lot of this nationalism has been electorally validated. Uh, and, and there are multiple reasons. I mean, there are countries where uh, it's a sort of positive, assertive nationalism. In some cases, it's more insecure nationalism. Uh, but the fact is, a more nationalistic world obviously is a less multilateral world. The third is uh, that the West, which was, in a sense, the old order. The, I would say, if you talk of Westlessness, there is a Westfulness. And uh, no pun intended, uh, but the, that era, I, I, I think the West was so sure that it would sort of extend into infinity that it actually didn't cultivate broader constituencies of support in the rest of the world. And so when, when uh, political rebalancing happened, uh, I think today uh, you can see uh, the gaps in a sense, and I say this, say, between the West and the South. Uh, and bear in mind that large parts of the global South are actually democratic, and most, you know, most of all, beginning with my country. So even though they share a lot of political values and beliefs, yet uh, there is a very visible gap between the West uh, and the South. To some extent, there's the you know, dichotomy of interests and beliefs. You know, a lot of countries didn't practice what they preached. So what happened was when it came to multilateralism, uh, the exceptions were so many over such a long period of time that I think the rules got weakened. Uh, and of course, it didn't help that uh, the United Nations is far less credible than uh, it has been in history, uh, which of course is not entirely surprising because when you think about it, you know, in your daily life, there aren't too many things which are 75 years old and still as good as they were. Uh, so uh, clearly, there's, there's something which needs to be done there. A lot of new challenges that the world faces, challenges of technology which were discussed, challenges of connectivity, I think these are not readily amenable to multilateral uh, solutions. Uh, these are also less influenced by the West. 
so the wistfulness factor kicks in, uh, wistlessness factor kicks in there as well. So uh, I, I think all of these have been trends which have reinforced each other over a period of time. So we come to the, uh, the other issue raised, what do you do about it? I think for the West, uh, if it is going to be less dominant in the world, you do what you do in politics. You create coalitions. You look for convergences. So if the multilateral system is not working well enough, you support it with plurilateral arrangements. Uh, you, you make new compacts. Uh, so I think those are, and, and those could be political, uh, those could be security, uh, uh, you know, burden sharing, is a term which has a specific connotation in this geography, but I think it's, it's frankly a practical concept today in the world. I, I think uh, issues like counterterrorism, maritime security are issues where there is need for, for greater global burden sharing. Uh, I would also say one of the challenges which the West will face is how to get out of the alliance mindset. I mean, it's the business of the West to mind its alliances, I'm not disputing that. But I think the reality of this new world is Western countries have to look beyond alliances and work with partners beyond alliances who will come from a different place with a different history. So how do you develop the, uh, the mechanisms to work uh, with such countries? So uh, to, to sum up really, I would say, if you are looking at a more multipolar world, uh, then clearly, uh, you know, how do you, uh, I mean, to me, it's important uh, that, and a multipolar world is a westlessless world. Uh, it's important that a multipolar world requires actually more, not less multilateralism, uh, so that there is greater stability, because at the end of the day, when we all speak about global rebalancing, what we don't want is imbalancing. Thank you very much, Dr. Jayashankar. Uh, just a quick follow-up on that, because you ended with this lovely line about uh, a multipolar world requires more multilateralism, not less. To what extent do you think that even the focus of the Western democracies on the notion of, of the West and now Westlessness is in fact making it harder for them to find common ground with other countries which are from the global south, for example, um, which perhaps share some of those values, it's just that they don't necessarily call them Western values. We heard a little bit about this also in the previous panel. Well, I, look, I, I think it would sort of depend on the issue. Uh, our President Steinmeier reminded us earlier in the evening that the United States, for example, is focused much more on Asia uh, than it used to be, much more on Asia, perhaps, than on Europe. Uh, so you've seen a sort of a nimbleness and a, uh, American adaptability to a new global national security situation. Uh, on the other hand, I would say, if you look at Europe, Europe has realized the importance of working with the global south when it comes to climate change. So I wouldn't say that one has necessarily been smarter than the other. I think it depends on the issue. I think both have done well in some areas, both have done not well in some areas. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Vice President Vestager, over to you. Y you y Europe itself is a multilateral actor, and it has been very influential in shaping our notion of multilateralism, a universal multilateralism more broadly in the way that it negotiates in the World Trade Organization, for example. And yet, Europe, too, is facing some serious problems. Um, why are we seeing these problems? Well, I think it's, <clears throat> it's a very interesting question. And as, as you say, it's simple, but definitely not simplistic um, to figure out, well, well, when we're in a world where we obviously need common solutions, we're not going to fight climate change on our own, obviously, then why is it that we find it so tricky to, to find it? Um, well, for, uh, for me, multilateralism is a tool. It's a tool to be able to do something. And, um, and, and that is the way, I think, for everyone to have a kind of a rule-based uh, international order. Uh, you're right to say that the rules were set up 
by the so-called uh, West. And I think the limitations coming from that, that they have been well discussed. Uh, also by a, a perception, right or wrong, that the West also saw itself uh, as being somewhat elevated. And I think it's a very good thing that that has been uh, changed. But the other thing is that uh, our multilateral system was set up in an analog world. Uh, and the world is definitely not analog uh, anymore. Uh, we are s lucky here to have a physical interaction. We can feel each other. We can better, I think, read each other because we're in the same room. But very often, we'll not be in the same room. We're in a digital world where opinions are being uh, formed, economic value is being created, uh, great powers compete. Uh, it is a, it's a major change. And uh, that also means that the tools of power, they do change. Uh, that be uh, industrial espionage, uh, tax avoidance, uh, disinformation, uh, foreign influence on elections, uh, terrorist propaganda, the security of critical infrastructure, uh, mass surveillance, we're really in a, a different world compared to the world when our multilateral system was set up. And uh, that, of course, allows both people and businesses and states to be less accountable uh, because it is opaque, this digital world, because we do not have a multilateral system that is digital, and that allows for an opaqueness uh, to come about, which I really do not think serves anyone well. So the question is, of course, when our multilateral system is outdated, well, what do we do? Do we abandon it or renew it? Well, as I see it very often in, in competition law enforcement, uh, which is one of the things I do in the European Commission, well, the fundamental rules, they're fine, because they deal with greed and with fear and with uh, the lust for power. These are fundamentals. And it may be that we're now digital, but as humans, we have not changed whatsoever. Uh, I still think that the fundamentals, they remain the same. And the tricky thing is that we, if we allow a world without order uh, then to be the new world, well, we know what is going to happen, then the weaker ones, they will suffer uh, because of the strength uh, of others. And we know from history what that leads to, and that I think we should not allow to happen. So, I think it's very important that we find ways to change the way multilateralism works, but not to give up the tool, because the problems are the same. Um, security problem, climate change, tax avoidance, these problems, they need a global approach. Um, and, and Europe will participate in that renewal of multilateralism and to find new ways. But of course, we'll try to do that from a position of strength, because I think that nationalism is a way to renew multilateralism as well. Because when people have a stronger identity, actually very often it's much easier to, to deal with them. Because you know where you're starting from, you know this is the problem, so that you can find a common way to go. So it can be, if interpreted in a positive way, instead of setting us apart, be the thing that allows us to work together in a different way. And in that, uh, for instance, uh, we push for global standards for privacy. Uh, and of course, very happy to see that the, the general data protection uh, rules that we have are inspiring a global debate. Um, we want to have uh, ethical, human-centered AI, uh, especially uh, if it's risky when it comes to fundamental values. Of course, we'll make up our own mind, but of course, we hope to inspire also globally. We're very active uh, within the OECD when it comes to taxation, to sort of renew uh, our take on, on taxation globally, because in a digital world, it's a completely different matter than what it was uh, 20 years ago. Uh, when it comes to subsidies, the WTO really needs renewal. And with uh, US friends and, and the Japanese, uh, we have proposed changes in order for the WTO to work much better, much more efficiently uh, with subsidies. So I think the important thing is to uh, sort of be more assertive for everyone uh, who wants to be in a geopolitical game, but to use that assertiveness to reassess, well, how can we then make multilateralism uh, work? And, and at least for, for us as Europeans, this is a priority.
Thank you very much. That is, that is fascinating. And, uh, and your point about the, about the change from the analog world to the digital world, in fact, being a game changer also for our institutions is a very important one. And it, has, it, it creates new linkages between economics, economic issues and security issues. But, um, and so you outlined some of the ambitions that Europe could take on in this. And that aligns also with what Minister Maas was saying. He was setting out a very ambitious agenda for Europe. But um, my quick follow-up on this would be, how ready is Europe to take this on, given uh, some of the internal challenges, internal divisions that Europe faces now, also because of the challenges of digitalization? Mm. Well, I think there's a very strong um, realization of the rebalancing of the, of the economy and because of that also rebalancing of, of global uh, sort of political power. And that basically is a success. It really is a good thing that many more people are richer, better off, uh, assert themselves on a global scale. That's a good thing. Um, the thing is, we have had, uh, may sound strange, but there is a silver lining to everything. The experience during the Brexit, uh, the first phase of Brexit, what the 27 can achieve when coming together. Uh, and I can tell you, it, it wasn't for lack of temptation for one European member state or another European member state uh, to sort of to, to break out of the unity between, between the 27. But because of the transparency in the process, that Parliament was briefed every week, that member states, they were briefed every week. With the transparency, then unity could be achieved. Uh, because obviously, uh, you put the finger on, on the sore point, Europe can achieve amazing things, but only if we have the unity and the willingness to find compromise. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, Minister Kang, over to you. Um, uh, South Korea is also, we have a big debate in Europe about being caught between the pincer movement of China and the United States. South Korea also faces some of these challenges um, and has been a very keen multilateralist as some of your own previous appointments also show. So um, perhaps you could give us some insights also from the region in terms of why multilateralism is, is facing this crisis now. Well, I, I think it's important to start out by saying that um, the values that have underpinned multilateralism are no longer the preserve of the West. These are now universal values uh, that shape the conduct of governments, civil society, peoples, to varying degrees, mind you, but they are the standards that all countries aspire to achieve. So this idea of Westlessness may be a necessary soul-searching um, point uh, for Europe, the center of West at this point, and maybe natural, uh, in response to the, to the rise of non-Western powers in other parts of the world. But for somebody coming in from the non-West and taking part in this debate, uh, I feel that the discussion is too, too insular. And I think we need to take multilateralism beyond the Western, the European context, and to see how multilateralism is played out in other parts of the world. For example, in, in Asia, we talk about ASEAN centrality. In ASEAN is a subgrouping, it's a multilateral um, grouping of 10 ASEAN countries that have been around for half a century. And they offer another model of multilateralism that has worked very well uh, for the countries and, and the, the countries around the region, including South Korea. And I'll talk about ASEAN centrality. So there's a lot more to multilateralism uh, than the models that we discuss in this context. Yes, Korea is, is, is a huge beneficiary of uh, multilateralism. And, and we have become a model democracy and market economy by fully embracing the values of universal values that this multilateral inter, uh, order has, has, has um, established and really made the most of the openness and the interdependencies that this has created. And we certainly hope to explore new opportunities for multilateral endeavors with partners who share the, the same vision and goals. And we very much support the German 
French initiative of the Alliance for Multilateralism and trying to revive um, the, 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 uh, the idea of the dialogue and, and uh, solutions that have the greatest buy-in of those who take in part because it, clearly the global challenges require that collective response and, and that collective response is not going to have much of an effect if it doesn't have that collective buy-in. Uh, so we're very, very supportive of that. I think in Korea, the idea of multilateralism is all the more keen, ironically, because in our part of the world, we have a lack of it. Uh, we don't have regional security structures. Right. Um, uh, and perhaps this is a reflection of the history and the recent history of the region, because we're also, you know, the last remaining legacy of the Cold War. Um, it may, and then the idea, our immediate challenge is to overcome this legacy, i.e. the division of the, the Korean Peninsula into South and North. And this challenge, of course, has been made many times more difficult by North Korea's nuclear and um, missiles development. But with the steadfast support of the global community, we have been pursuing a Korean Peninsula peace process of diplomatic engagement with North Korea. Uh, to overcome this Cold War legacy and to achieve North Korea's complete denuclearization. The dialogue recently has stalled, but we are determined to stay the course and uh, make progress. Um, and in the meanwhile, we are proposing some multilateral initiatives, if you can call it that way. For example, asking the international community, in particular the UN agencies such as UNESCO, to work with us to get the DMZ between South and North Korea uh, declared and supported as an international peace zone, which would be then a physical and institutional guarantee, if you will, of security both ways, both to the North and both to the South. And we think these would be concrete steps toward uh, resolving the, uh, the, the legacy on the Korean Peninsula. I think it's um, important when we talk about multilateralism to make sure that we do so in connection with the people uh, who we ultimately serve. Uh, none of this would matter if it doesn't mean much to the people on the street. And here I think we have some troubling trends as well as some encouraging ones. Um, and on the one hand, we do see that the public is increasingly impatient and uh, a huge amount of discontent with the political leadership, uh, whether it's local or national. And we've seen this play out in, in last year uh, through some you know, explosive, massive, and sometimes violent uh, demonstrations on the streets in many countries of the world. Um, and so there is this sense that the political leadership is not delivering. And this is an, is an you know, awesome challenge for national governments, but also uh, global institutions uh, that are the preserve of multilateralism should also clearly see where the limitations are in delivering for the discontent, the anger on the street. Um, on the other hand, the, the positive side of this is that the people are thinking, people on the street are thinking and, and, and wanting to act globally and also wanting more global action. And clearly, we see this on the, on the climate agenda. And I think, in particular, when we look at the younger generation, uh, they are keen to take on the challenge. Um, they, they are transcending the physical and the, and the mental barriers of borders. And I was just recently talking to the SG's envoy who is conducting a series of discussions with young leaders around the world in, to mark the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. And he says, wherever he opens up these discussions, invariably, the voices are one of strong hope and high expectations for global solutions to global issues. Uh, and, and that is what multilateralism is. And, and, I, and here, you'll excuse me if I gloat a bit. <laughs> and point you to the triumph of the Korean film, um, you'll, you'll know what I mean, Parasite, uh, mm -hmm. at the Academy Awards. In fact, we were also very shocked how 
much of an appeal this very Korean movie had to the global audience. And it wasn't just the academies. This film has been co collecting hundreds of awards at various film festivals throughout the year, clearly indicating that there is a global mindset that is receptive to things that are not necessarily tied down to the national context. And I think we need to make the most of this, this global mindset, which certainly the multilateral endeavors over the past decades have created, uh, have, have helped to nurture, but they're now running ahead of us. I mean, they're supercharged by, by the new media. And, and I think unless we come to grips with this, um, uh, we will be losing a huge track where we need uh, to see action on, on reviving the, the, uh, the multilateralism. I, I, on, the, on, this, on the name of this conference, Westlessness, I think, yes, I, I understand that perhaps it's necessary and perhaps um, natural uh, in the current historical context, but I assure you as, as somebody coming from the non-West, the West is very much alive and not necessarily physically, but you know, in the East, people in the East, as I hope, the East is very much in the mindset of, of, of the West. Uh, so perhaps a better framing when we discuss the future of multilateralism is not necessarily to tie it down to the West, uh, not necessarily tie it down to any geographical distinctions for that matter, and, and throw the discussion open wide to the larger globe. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much for those very fascinating remarks. I have a bunch of questions, but I will restrict myself to one and a half for a quick follow-up. Uh, one, um, you, uh, you talk about, thank you. Oh. It's very helpful that you remind us that Westlessness may be a little bit of an unnecessary soul searching on the part of Europe right now. Um, and then you gave us some nice examples for also ASEAN. And I was curious um, if you could give us any examples of uh, different approaches to multilateralism that the, that the West, the North, that Europe, that the US could learn from um, in the rest of the world. That's one. And two, um, I'm very happy you mentioned the Alliance for Multilateralism in something that Germany and France have been taking a lead on. And I would be very curious to hear how you see this alliance um, expanding, and by expansion I mean, uh, does the agenda, uh, it, right now it looks like a very pragmatic alliance, along the lines of what Dr. Jayashankar was also saying. But do you see it as also developing into something more principle-based, more value-based? Well, I think, um, I think um, uh, President Stenmeyer uh, had give us some key, key terms in his speech today, which was realism. Um, there's no point, you know, wallowing in what is no longer there. Um, you, you deal with the reality uh, and, and you bring to the table the values that you think are important. Yes, I think values are absolutely important. Um, they anchor the discussions and they, they give you the direction, but based upon realism and also curiosity, uh, I think we fail m in many times when we go, and I know this myself because I've been a part of the, the system, the, uh, the, mainly the, the Human Rights Office and the Humanitarian Office in the, in the, in the we, f we fail to be curious. We go to the ground with preconceived uh, agendas. And I think um, that limits us. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, and much depends on the receptivity on the ground. So I think the president was underscoring this point as well, that realism and curiosity, plus I think he was also speaking about humility. The ASEAN approach is, um, if I think, much more, um, much more, that kind of an approach. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it, you know, it doesn't impose. Um, and it, it, I think that lack, you know, not imposing 
makes it easier for member states to be a part of the solidarity. Uh, and I think that then creates the space for uh, endeavors toward common norm setting. There's a huge amount of uh, ASEAN norms that have uh, evolved over the, over the past five decades. It may not be satisfactory to the let's get this and done at, at the quick, quick and, um, you know, wanting to codify everything every time there's, a, there's an issue. I think eventually codification is important because that's, that's the ultimate um, standard that you come up with. But I think, you know, pacing it with the reality um, and making sure that the receptivity is there. I mean, you can't go from minus 10 to 10 degrees uh, overnight. Um, I think you need to have a sense of what is realistically feasible. Thank you, Minister Kang. Uh, Senator Graham, uh, we're very happy to have you here with us, and especially as in Europe there seems to be almost a sense of hurt about how the U.S., the big game changer for many in Europe is that the U.S., which, is, which had helped set up the multilateral order, is now abandoning it. So is that, is that feeling justified that we get in various media reports and various analyses and so forth? And if it is, what will it take to bring the US back uh, to the table? And that's really going back to the fundamental question, why is the US so unhappy about multilateralism as it functions today? Well, one, thank you for having me. Uh, how many people here are elected officials? <laughs> okay. <laughs> So we have 40 members of Congress that are here in an election year. How many of you can vote in South Carolina? All right, I'll see you in a minute. So the point I'm trying to make is that we care or we wouldn't be here. You've got the Speaker of the House. You've got the Secretary of Defense. You've got the Secretary of State. You've got 41 members of Congress, or 43, Republicans and Democrats chose to be here when there's more votes over there. <laughs> so the reason I come here is because my dear friend John McCain taught me and anybody who's willing to learn that when it comes to threats, it's, to better, it's better to have partners. When it comes to doing things, you wish you didn't have partners. <laughs> so here's the point. President Trump ran an American first campaign. Is it like the American first of the 30s? No. Isolationism? No, I've come to believe it's not. It's about burden sharing. And he struck a chord that NATO is paying more. That's good. $400 billion. That makes it easier for me to go back to South Carolina and say that this is a good deal for the United States. Uh, trade deals. Clinton and Trump both ran against the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. Obama tried to negotiate it, but the Democrat and the Republican said, bad deal. So President Trump was able to tap into the idea that trade agreements, the WTO as we know it, needs to change. There's the WTO before China's rise, and there's the WTO after China's rise. And if we don't change the WTO to deal with the new China, then you're going to get frustrated people looking for ways to deal with their problems. So. My belief is that the American people get it when it comes to NATO. That it's been a long-standing commitment. Millions of American soldiers have come to Europe serving in the American military, and we're all there to defeat communism. The problem for these groups now is usually multilateral organizations are designed around opportunity or threat. We come together to deal with a threat, like climate change. So you got the Paris Accords, 
that President Trump said, no, not really that good deal for us, really good deal for China, really good for India, but not that good a deal for us. The point I would make to President Trump is what would be a better deal? One, is it a problem? And if it's a problem, if it's half the problem we say it is, then you're gonna need a multilateral approach. You all agree? I mean, you can't solve climate change from the United States or Europe or India. So I'm hoping to have the Trump administration tell the international community what they're looking for. I think we owe that to you. One thing not mentioned by the, the foreign minister of Germany was Iran. Part of the problem here is we maybe see Iran a bit differently in terms of threat. We all get it when it comes to ISIS and Al-Qaeda and Al-Shabaab, you just fill out the list, right? I'm a pretty interventionist guy for American politics in 2020. Not because I want to go fight all the time, I just want to keep the war away from home. Don't you think there's a fatigue in the West about the war on terror? Remember the Marshall Plan? I can show you what we got for all of our money. <laughs> we got a vibrant democracy here in Europe, all over the place. Our reconstruction efforts in Japan, South Korea. It's pretty hard to tell the American people what you've got in Iraq and Afghanistan and Syria after a lot of money and a lot of dying. And here's what I would tell them you have, hope. It's pretty hard to talk about a war if people can't explain what winning looks like. What is winning? If you want a European defense force, fine. Who's the enemy? So the problem we have, I think, in the West and throughout the world is to explain to the American people and our European friends that winning in the war on terror is not conquering a capital. It's not shooting down an air force. It's not sinking a navy. It's defeating an ideology. And people have lost hope in growing numbers that that can be done. Count me out. I've got more hope than ever, and I'm an outlier. With John McCain, I've been to Iraq and Afghanistan 57 times. What have I learned? You know when you get it right, and you know when you get it wrong. There are millions of young girls who've been educated since 2001 that if we stay with it, we'll have a voice for their children that's never been had in Afghanistan. And I'm constantly talking to President Trump. The payoff is generations away. And the hardest thing for democracies is patience. When the threat is real, nobody is more engaged in the United States. But we want to leave as quick as we can. When will it be over? Is there any hope of winning? So here's what I would say to the West. When it comes to fighting in Syria and Iraq and Afghanistan, we have to do a better job of explaining what the payoff looks like. And President Trump has bought us some time by insisting that people on the ground over there do more. We're down to 8,600 pretty soon in Afghanistan. That's a counterterrorism footprint we can sustain for a very, very long time. I can sell that. I can't sell 150,000 people in Iraq and Afghanistan forever. NATO, when you put three or 4,000 on top of the 8,600, it is so much easier for me to sell it back home. So multilateralism is suffering from fatigue when it comes to the war on terror. When it comes to the world economy, it's changing so quick it makes your head spin. We're yet to get our hands around how to deal with China. It's gotten so big and so prosperous so fast that the rule-making systems that were designed after World War II seem to be of left into the dust. 
So end with this thought. To everybody that I appear in front of in South Carolina, I say that you may be tired of fighting radical Islam. They're not tired of fighting you. You can fight the war in their backyard or your backyard. Those are your choices. You can play like the economy is not global and you will lose because it is. If you don't believe in climate change, you're making a big mistake because you're going to wake up one day and the world's going to be fundamentally different. So what I say is you pay now or you pay later. And the best way to get outcomes is to have other people work with you. That's a hard sell in a soundbite world. But there is no other alternative. Okay, thank you very much, Senator Graham, for, this, uh, for some very frank comments. Um, I, have a, I, have, I have a ton of follow-up questions for you, but I know that the audience is keen to ask questions. Um, actually, there's the, uh, the tradition of the, our um, Munich Young Leader going first. So, Claudia, over to you. Please, Claudia. Hello, um, my name is uh, Claudia Gamon. I'm a member of the European Parliament, so one of the elected officials. And I would like to pick up on something that Senator Graham has just said about the institutions that were formed after the end of the Second World War. We have talked a lot about uh, the importance of rule-based institutions in multilateralism, but there is one example to make it concrete, the WTO and the missing reforms. However, it has been paralyzed also by something that um, the United States have done, um, blocking the appointment of judges to the appellate body, bringing us back to the GATT times, which um, kind of gave rule breakers the upper hand at the time. And now the EU has joined a coalition to do a workaround around it, diminishing any leverage that would have been had for reform. So, what is the contribution of the United States to reforming these systems, or are you planning to abandon the WTO, and what will happen then? Because this will be one of the points where we could very concretely talk about how to revive multilateralism in today's changing economy. Thank you. Really good question. I think you've got to convince President Trump the WTO could work, because I'm not so sure he believes it will. He believes it's failed miserably when it comes to China, but Lighthizer and others see the WTO reformed in the right way as the best control on a China who cheats uh, on multiple levels. So we're having this discussion back home is how do you reform it versus breaking it? And President Trump is gonna have to make a decision about when to take the pressure off and engage, give you a list of reforms. What do you want, President Trump? What do you want the WTO to look like? If you don't like the Paris Accords, what do you like? If you don't like the Iran nuclear agreement, what do you like? Now, I'm not beating on the president, but these are hard things. Britain, if you don't like the European Union, what do you like? So I think we owe it, quite frankly, to give you some feedback as to what it should look like. Um, I've got an idea with uh, Senator Menendez to replace the current JCPOA with a international fuel bank in France or wherever you want to put it, where all the Arab nations and the Iranians can have all the nuclear power they want, but the fuel rods will be made outside the region and it will be a guaranteed fuel supply so nobody has to enrich. And enrichment is how you get a bomb. So I'm trying to find ways to not just say what we don't like when it comes to the Paris Accords. Hopefully we can start talking among ourselves as Americans, what would a better deal look like? I think we owe that to you. Thank you. Please, the gentleman in the front. Hi, my name is Paul Horvath, and I'm a guest of the U.S. delegation. Um, I'd like to direct um, my comment of or question to the d distinguished foreign minister of India and maybe ask you to expand on 
your, I believe was your second point, which is that the West was so sure of its infinite supremacy that it failed to explore other avenues of engagement with other parts of the world. Um, I'd like to, I'm not so sure I agree with it, and indeed, I think one of the reasons, at least from the US perspective, that we may be in the mess that we're in, is there's many who believe that it was quite the opposite, that it was incredible amounts of engagement actually with India and China, China more on trade, India more on information technology, that got us to where we were. So maybe you could expand on that and explain it, because it's not something that I'm quite sure I understand. Sure. Uh, well, you know, I was looking over a longer time frame, uh, say post Second World War, not just the last uh, 10 or 20 years. Uh, and uh, the reason I said that was, today if you look at a rules-based order, if you look at democratic practices, you look at pluralistic societies, I think uh, after 1945, one of the reasons why people thought that political democracy, market economy, pluralistic societies could be the universal norm was because a poor developing country which had just got its in independence chose those options. So by India choosing those options, it took it out of it being a solely Western characteristic and made it much broader. And over a period of time, a number of other countries in the global south in uh, Asia and Africa have, have uh, followed suit. Now, when it comes today to a lot of these practices, I think it's important that if the standards and conversations and interests are narrowly West, then the tendency is to say, well, you know, this is a Western problem. This is not a global problem. Uh, I mean, we've seen, you know, when, we, when I was analyzing why is it multilateralism is weaker, why has Westlessness happened? Part of it is that, uh, the, you know, uh, the resort to conveniences. I mean, I'll give you an example. You know, there was a period where we had a military dictatorship to the east of India and to the west of India at the same time. The one east of India got sanctioned in Myanmar. The one west of India ended up as a major non-NATO ally. So, you know, these, so what happens is, in many ways, uh, I would say the lot of the messages about values and beliefs and order and rules tended to be uh, vitiated by, uh, by the politics of the day. And I, I think what it did was, it, in a sense, there is a, today a constituency, I think, for the West beyond the West. I mean, if you ask me in India, and I think uh, my colleague from South Korea, in a way, uh, said it, perhaps not as explicitly as I'm saying to you. I, would, I, I think uh, non-Western democratic societies have an interest in the West. They would not like to see the West weakened. Uh, you know, for them uh, today, the West would be less dominant, but still an uh, integral, indispensable part of a global multipolar society. And for that, I think you need, uh, you know, uh, shall I say, uh, much uh, more conversations, more working arrangements. Uh, when it comes today to challenges like maritime security, counterterrorism, that you know, the whole lot of global commons management issues. Uh, I, I do think that the West would be better served finding partners uh, beyond the West. And I think beyond the West is open to that. Uh, Roland Paris, the gentleman at the back there. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting discussion so far. Uh, my qu I'm Roland Paris from the University of Ottawa in Canada, former advisor to uh, Justin Trudeau. Uh, question is for uh, Senator Graham. And the uh, United States is asking, in some cases insisting, that its allies do certain things in relation to China now. <laughs> And the question really is whether the United States will have its allies back. And I've, uh, the specific uh, question I want to ask relates to the arrest of uh, Ms. Meng uh, Wangzhou in, in Canada on a United States extradition request. As you well know, uh, China right afterwards uh, detained uh, two innocent Canadians in apparent retaliation 
And uh, a year ago at this forum, you, you addressed that issue and you said, uh, and this was very much welcomed by Canadians, that you thought that the Trump administration should be doing more to try to secure their release. Uh, could you comment on what your thoughts are uh, in relation to the U.S. administration's actions a year later? Thank you. Uh, I think we need to do more as a world. Uh, this is a big deal. Do you, do you understand what he's talking about? Okay, so you got a Huawei official <clears throat> that we indicted in the United States, lives in Canada, you have an extradition treaty. Uh, she's fighting extradition lawfully. China grabs two Canadians because they're pissed. It could be you next. So what we got to do is get this one right. So when I get back, I just talked to the Prime Minister Trudeau today, and he's been a really good ally standing up for the rule of law. China is not known for the rule of law. They made a deal with Hong Kong. They're trying to break it. If we let them get away with that, anytime you let somebody break a deal to the benefit of you and your friends, you'll regret it if you don't push back. So he challenged us today to try to make this more international response. Not only should we do more, but we should almost have sort of an Article 5 response economically and tell China, when you grab two Canadians because of an extradition treaty with the United States and Canada, that's not going to be accepted because literally it could be your citizens next. When you push back on China, they don't play by the rules. Huawei. And the one thing you need to get is that politics back home is about as screwed up as I've ever seen it. We just got through impeaching the president and the State of the Union address. What do we agree on? That Huawei technology is a threat to the United States and we really think to world order. So Nancy Pelosi and Donald Trump probably are not going to have many dinners together, but if you ask them about British purchase of Huawei, they'll give you the same answer. Now, we owe it to the world, all of us do, to give you an alternative. We just can't say no forever to 5G, but we're very firm in our commitment, Republicans and Democrats, that if you go down the Huawei road, you're going to burn a lot of bridges. Back to your original question. Not only am I going to go back home and say we need to do more, I'm going to try to get a more of an international response because what our Canadian friends are asking is not too much, and the world should actually come to your aid, not just the United States. Thank you. Uh, the lady in the front here, please. Uh, hello, Professor Katarzyna Pisarska. I'm the director of the European Academy of Diplomacy in Warsaw, Poland. I wanted to challenge you maybe uh, on the definition of the West uh, because the West itself seems very uh, exclusive. I mean, in, in the sense that you're the West or you're not the West. Shouldn't we be actually talking about countries that are democracies and those who, which are not, those who care about their citizens' rights and those who don't, those who understand the rule of law and international law and those who, who do not? And if India on, or Denmark and Korea or the United States fail to meet those standards, they should simply not be seen as part of the West, while those who do aspire and want to and deliver should be part of the West. My country was part of the East for so long, and all of a sudden I find myself on a conference when people see me as the West. It's wonderful because I remember still as a young person that we were these Easterners from the other bloc. That has changed. So how should we make the West more inclusive, and is that democratic approach the way forward? Thank you. Real quick, does the, is the West a synonym, uh, does it mean democracy? When you say West, do you mean democracy? If you do, then it's not about the West. It's about democracy. And this is the hardest thing right now to get the American public behind the idea that supporting young democracies is in our long-term best interest because we've had so many stops and starts in Afghanistan and in Iraq and Syria is just a complete mess. But I think you put your finger on it. What we're talking about here 
is the rule of law and representative government. We're not talking about Jeffersonian American democracy. John McCain, to his dying day, believed two things. That there are rules, and you should follow them, and that every human being on the planet has the right to self-determination. And I think that really is what the West means. And the West is really South Korea. I think, think that's an excellent point. Uh, after all, the planet is round. So, <laughs> yes, where is the, the West? That's sort of built on an idea that the world is flat and eventually you'd fall off. So, to some degree, it's nonsense. And I, for me, it's very sort of uh, interesting because I never ever thought about the Westlessness before I heard it in this conference, never. So, for me, it's like, okay, are, we, are we here discussing our own depression? And, and asking the rest of the world sort of to join in as a sort of a collective mindfulness exercise. I don't really get this. Uh, because I see the values that were, you know, first uh, put to the world states in, well, probably before Greece, but at least in Greece. They have expanded. You see them all over. You see them in the world's biggest democracy. You see them in Asian countries. You see them down under. You see them everywhere and exactly the rule of law and the integrity of the individual. That is how you know it, and that is how you should know it. And, and for us, it's just step out of depression and say, well, this is Europe, this is great. We want to be a wonderful, strong partner with the rest of the world. That's the point. May I? You know, look, I think it's an interesting point you raised because historically, there is a reason why Western democracy were equated. But over a period of time, I think the West needs to outgrow that. Because today, more people live in non-Western democracies than in Western democracies. So, you know, still, we are all creatures of habit. Uh, so we use shorthand formulations, even if they are anachronistic. Uh, so I, I take your point. But I think part of Westlessness is a kind of, the West has to understand this larger rebalance, as I said, the rebalancing. The fact that even democracy today, uh, there are people in other continents who own it and claim it as strongly as people in Europe or North America do. Uh -oh. I, I think I, I No, I'm, I'm part of the East, I'm part of the South, I'm part of the West, I'm universal. <laughs> so, I'm India. The, the senator's last comment, I think, hit the nail on the head. South Korea is West, if you're going by values. I think, I think there was a comment in the film that was introduced at the beginning when one said, instead of talking about the West, let's talk about the values that we're trying to prove. Mm. And I think as long as these values are grounded in the dignity of the human being, uh, and I think there is much common ground. And, uh, but it's also important to, to remember that we also need to talk to those who don't share our values. Uh, it's, uh, you know, we have a neighbor who don't share our values, definitely, but we need to talk uh, to overcome the, the huge security challenge. And so as we try to promote and strengthen the values among like-minded, we also need to talk to those who don't necessarily do so. Yeah, this is a really good question, I think. So if Scotland gets out of the... UK, it'll be through the democratic process, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Uh, Crimea was annexed with a Russian tank in front of your door. It's probably not a good way to vote. I end every discussion at home about war and democracy and why it matters we're over there. I said, name a war between two democracies. And here's where Pakistan and India have to make sure I'm never wrong. <laughs> so, I can't think of a war between two democracies, can you? Because we will find a way through the rule of law and trading and working our problems out. And you know, when you got a land dispute, you work it out. Well, the China's not working it out. They're building military bases on islands in dispute. Kashmir. You got two democracies, two very good allies. India, over a billion people. You got China who's trying to shut down 
everything close to democracy. In India, you're, you're, you're moving forward. You're having elections. You got your problems like we do at home. But you've chosen the democratic path. When it comes to Kashmir, I don't know how it ends, but let's make sure that two democracies will end it differently. And if you can prove that concept here, then I think it's probably the best way to sell democracy. Don't worry, Senator. One democracy will settle it. <laughs> and you know which one. Uh, um, uh, the gentleman over there. And if the panel feels OK about this, perhaps we could collect a couple of questions. Is that OK with you? OK. First I have to go in about two minutes. OK, so please Thank be brief. You. OK. Uh, my name is Abbas Aslani. I'm a, a Munich Leader 2020 member. Uh, I'm a senior research fellow at the Center for Middle East Strategic Studies based in Tehran, Iranian capital city. Uh, Minister Moss said that uh, the future of Middle East is decided in Astana rather than in Geneva or in New York. Uh, if we could consider that there could be challenges or threats to the West uh, or the very order that the West itself has established but it is undermining and questioning today, uh, if it comes from, whether it, it comes from inside as a result of the division among the members in this, in this camp, if that is the division, does it come as a result of, let's say, the dynamism of the developments, which might bring uh, miscalculation to make mistakes? Or does it come as a result of unilateralism when the United States withdraws from the nuclear deal, ignoring the will of other countries? On the second hand, we might have an external threat or challenge, which can be the rising of other countries that can be China, Russia, India, Korea, Japan, and other countries in Could the you West. Your question? Which uh, part or element would you blame more for that, for that restlessness? Is it external threat or inter internal? For the internal threat, is it uh, for the unilateralism or for the dynamism? Thank you. And the gentleman here who's been very patient as well. Thank you, Madam. The Latvian Vice Prime Minister and Defence Minister. Uh, I very much agree with the um, Korean Minister because uh, even in Europe we sometimes discuss is every European country enough Western or not, but definitely South Korea and Japan is West in my mind. But once we do discuss Westlessness, I think we sometimes mean that our value system and our role in the world is falling. And isn't it that sometimes we are trying, particularly in Europe, to stress more our fight for values just because we are losing power? And the paradox is that we will not be capable to keep West more seen if we will lose this power, which requires instead, again, a practical and rational approach, which sometimes maybe we are in real politics missing. Thank you. Please, who would like to? Well, uh, you got to go back to the threat. North Korea. I don't believe that Kim Jong-un is going to wake up tomorrow and, you know, hit Los Angeles. I don't want to give him that capability and miscalculate. I do worry that if he gets hydrogen bombs and more missiles, he'll sell them or they'll get compromised. I believe the Iranian regime, if they had a nuclear weapon, would use it. The Iranian people, I think, would be great allies to the world. The religious theocracy in Iran, to me, is the greatest threat on the planet. And any nuclear deal has to understand who you're dealing with. It's hard to believe that, and Hitler wanted to kill all the Jews, but he did. And he wrote a book about it. Now, when our German friend was talking about all the problems throughout the world, he never mentioned Iran once. If you want to fix Syria, you better get the Iranians out of Damascus. If you want to keep Iraq from falling apart, you need to deal with Iran. If you want to keep a Lebanon from going south, you, ne you need to deal with Iran. It's been the cancer of the Mideast. Count me in for peaceful nuclear power for the Iranian people. If you want a nuclear power program, you can have it. 
there are 16 countries that have nuclear power plants that don't make their own fuel. So here's what I'd like to offer to the Iranian government. Sanctions relief for a deal that would put the Arab states and the Iranians on the same footing. Everybody can have nuclear power. The fuel supply will come from France or someplace else, guaranteed, but nobody can enrich. The biggest miscalculation of the JCPOA, in my view, was not understanding who you're dealing with. They want a bomb. I hope they prove me wrong by accepting nuclear power without enrichment. And I've got to go. God bless you all. <laughs> Thank you. I would like to give, an, if, uh, would any of you like to respond to the last two questions? I, I would like to uh, respond to the last question. Thank you. Um, because I think the important thing here is that we stop talking about the West because it keeps us in the past. Uh, it keeps us with an idea of the West, West being a superior place and not accepting the rebalancing of the world. Because basically, the last 70 years have, have been, in, in general, hugely successful. In particular, the last 20 years, where we've been fighting extreme poverty, uh, diseases, lack of education. You know, the world has been so successful. And now here we are complaining about the West not being sort of on the top of the world instead of seeing ourselves as renewed partners for a much stronger world where the values that we originally, uh, in Europe, built the societies, are, they are now widely shared, and in some places outside of Europe, uh, even stronger than with us, because we also have the internal tensions. And I think it is important to break out of this, say, well, we're on a round planet, and we found, find partners all over the world, not in regret of what was, but in, in full engagement uh, to create a, a much stronger multilateral system. Uh, and I think to some degree we have, and this is why I, I find this also, there is a cleansing uh, effect of this debate, to say, well, okay, now we discussed it, let's now leave it and see the world that it is, because we have amazing partners based on the rule of law and with a fundamental respect of the integrity of the individual, and that is what builds multilateralism. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. That is a beautiful, eloquent summation of a very vibrant debate. We've covered a lot of ground. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking the panel. Thank you. Thank you.